Okay, um, welcome to the second lecture on computational social choice. Um, so this lecture will be quite different from the first lecture because I mentioned last week already that in last lecture I just wanted to give you a broad overview of different concepts in social choice. And probably when working on the exercises, you already realize that without having a formal framework, some things are a bit uh, unclear. Um, so for instance, um, how do we deal with ties? That was a common question. So how is monotonicity exactly defined? And in today's lecture, we are working in a very formal framework. So it's not particularly difficult, but we are working in the framework of choice theory, which is about uh, choices for an individual decision maker. And in contrast to the last lecture, so everything that we are going to use is being formally defined. So it will be quite mathematical lecture. Um, so also, in, in terms of applications, it will be quite a stretch, so uh, quite an abrupt transition. So last week we talked about concrete voting rules in concrete countries and applications of, of voting in general, whereas uh, in today's lecture we are talking about a very abstract thing, just making choices from a set of alternatives. In general, so just to give you some outline of what we are going to do today, so um, there are some terms that uh, perhaps I already mentioned last week informally, so concepts like rationality or being consistent uh, when making different choices. So we are going to make these terms precise, and the main theorem at in the second half of the lecture will be a characterization that shows uh, the equivalence between um, a rationality notion and a consistency notion. So that is the main result that we are aiming for today. Okay, um, so let's start to talk about choice theory. Um, so first, why are we talking about choice theory? I think that I have mentioned a couple of times. So bef before we can really analyze collective choices, and that is what, is, what, what social choice is about, we first need to have a basic understanding of individual choice. So um, today's lecture will be really completely closed. So, we are, so th that will be the only lecture completely devoted to choice theory. So it's like a quick summary of the main results in choice theory. So the framework is as follows. So we have a set U, a universe of alternatives. So these are all the possible alternative, uh, alternatives that we could eventually make a choice from. Um, so we assume there are at least two of these. So if there's only one alternative, there's well, only one thing to choose. And for some results that come later, um, this is actually necessary to have at least two of these. And then the idea is, uh, in choice theory, that various of these alternatives are offered in the form of a menu, and hence the picture there. So you can think of a, like a menu in a restaurant, for instance, where there are different dishes, and then there's a decision maker who wants to make a choice from these different ob that objects that are being offered. Um, so for instance, one running example that I keep using is, for instance, uh, you can think of this as a dessert menu, and there are three different desserts on the menu, um, A, B, C. So for instance, apple pie, brownies, and creme caramel. Um, and then this decision maker has to make a choice from these different objects. And in order to make this slightly more formal, we need some notation, of course. So the first notation that we are not only using in choice theory, but also later in social choice, is calligraphic f of a set, x. So x can just be any set. And then f of x denotes the set of all finite and non-empty subsets. Okay? Um, so this is basically the power set, except that we don't include um, the empty set as well. And we are going to apply this notion to, this, to the universe. So we have this finite universe of alternatives. So, so that means that f of u is just the set of all non-empty subsets of u. And those are being called feasible sets. And the idea is just that we are making a choice from a feasible set. So in, in, in general, the idea of choice theory is that we make choices from different feasible sets. And then, for instance, we can define conditions which say that these choices are consistent with each other because if we choose this item from that set and another item from another set, then we can define axioms which say under which circumstances these choices are consistent. Okay, so here's a very simple example. So we will start really with the basics. So for instance, if the universe consists of three alternatives, A, B, C, um, we would have those seven feasible sets. And then a choice function is a function that maps every feasible set to a feasible subset. Okay, so the idea is that we have this possible set of feasible alternatives, and then the decision maker chooses some of these items. So the, it's, it's not, so the decision maker is not only choosing a single item, but a set of items. And here it's important to realize that if you choose several items, like in the dessert example, if you choose A, B, and C, it doesn't mean that you take all three desserts, it just means that you're indifferent between all of these. So you like all of them equally much. 
Okay, so that is the idea if you choose a set of alternatives. And we, we need this because we also want to incorporate for indif indifferences in our model. Um, okay, so formally we have um, a mapping from the, from the set FU to the set FU um, with the important condition, of course, that you only choose a subset of the alternatives that are available in the feasible set. Okay. Um, All right, so um, there's an example here um, on the right-hand side here. Um, so here we take the universe ABC, so apple pie brownies and cream caramel, for instance. And on the left-hand side, we have the feasible sets. And on the right-hand side, we have um, the choice sets. So the, the sets of alternatives that are chosen from the feasible set. Um, so the set of feasible sets, as I, as I denoted on the slide, contains, uh, consists of seven sets. I didn't denote the singletons here for the feasible sets. So any idea why I omitted the singletons here? If I want to represent this function, um, you? Because they are trivial. Right, because they are trivial, um, because we have to choose at least one element from each set. So from the singletons, we are always choosing the singleton alternative itself. So from A, we are choosing A, from B, we are choosing B, and so on. So therefore, the only interesting choices are happening from sets that contain at least two elements. And in the example here, this decision maker is choosing A from AB and BC from uh, BC, so both alternatives here, um, A from AC, and from the set of all three alternatives, this decision maker is choosing A. Um, maybe one comment in general, if in case you, you read about choice theory elsewhere or you want to get a deeper understanding of this. So here we make the assumption that every set is feasible, but in many applications of choice theory, the set of feasible sets is constrained. So here, f of u is just the set of all possible subsets, but I guess you can think of other applications where only certain subsets are feasible sets. But in, in, the, in the case that we are considering here makes, makes it particularly nice and simple because then a function, a choice function, is just a function from f u to f u. Okay, um, so now we have a choice function. So that's the basic concept that we are talking about in today's lecture. Now, uh, without any additional conditions, I think uh, you hopefully agree that some choice functions don't really seem reasonable or violate some notion of rationality, even though we haven't defined these notions yet here. Um, so let me give you one example. So for instance, if you think that a decision maker is choosing alternative A from the feasible set ABC and alternative B from the feasible set AB, it seems like that would in some sense violate our intuitive understanding of rationality. And why is that the case? So if you again think of this dessert menu thing, for instance, that means that this, say, that this woman in the picture here is choosing apple pie from the, if all three desserts are available, and if then creme caramel doesn't seem to be, is, is not available in another choice setting, um, she, she would choose brownies rather than apple pie. Right? And, and th that seems a bit strange. So you, you could think of a setting, so I, I think I read this somewhere in a book, where, where a waiter is offering three desserts, and then this person chooses apple pie, and then the waiter says, oh, I'm sorry, so um, creme caramel is not an option, so we cannot do creme caramel today. Um, and then the, the guest in the restaurant says, okay, so in that case, I will take brownies rather than apple pie. <laughs> that seems really weird. Um, and of course, you can think of applications where this perhaps might make sense. So for instance, if the feasible set itself contains additional information of for instance, how good, so if, if creme caramel is available, maybe the apple pie is better than it usually is or something. Um, so therefore, the, the basic assumption um, in, in choice theory is that all the information is really only contained in the alternatives themselves, and the choices are menu independent. Okay, so you just choose something from the menu, but the menu itself doesn't really give you information that, that is useful in your choice. Okay, so and, and one of the basic threats for today's lecture is, is we want to formalize why, why is this bad. So that means we want to define axioms which say that, this, that a choice function that satisfies the axiom um, rules out these kinds of choices. Okay, so um, before we get there, so I would like to introduce a very fundamental model of rational decision making in economic theory. So this is not only in, in social choice or choice theory, so this is like really a, like a, a basic model um, in economics. And in economics, they really put a lot of effort into understanding notions like rationality and decision making. Um, so it's very simple. So the decision maker first asks him or herself the question, so what is desirable? So that means 
that the decision maker is in some form uh, building preferences over all the alternatives in the universe. So maybe a preference relation, maybe assigning utilities to the different options. So there are many different possibilities. In this course, it will usually be a preference relation. Next question is, is which alternatives are feasible? Okay, so then the choice is in some sense narrowed down to some set of options that are really feasible for the decision maker. And then the decision itself is choosing the most desirable among the feasible alternatives. Okay, most desirable could be alternatives that maximize my utility, or it could be alternatives um, that are maximal in an ordinal sense, so there's nothing that is strictly better um, if you only have ordinal preference relations. But the main point, so it, it seems extremely simple, but the main point that I want to make is the ordering here. Um, and, and in particular, the ordering perhaps confuses you at first because it seems rather inefficient to first build your preferences over all alternatives in the universe, and then only when you have to make a decision, you just narrow down to the feasible set in question, and then you just take the alternative which maximizes your utility or which is, which is most preferred according to your preferences. Um, so this is not so much a procedural question where we first build these preferences and then we, we make the choice from a feasible set. But the idea is, and that's why it's uh, written down in this kind of ordering, is that the preferences should be independent of the feasible set. So first we come up with the preferences, and then there's a feasible set, and what we prefer from this feasible set should be independent from the feasible set itself. Okay, so th that's why it's given in this ordering. So, we, so the assumption is that we somehow have preferences over everything, and only once we have to make a decision, we compare these different alternatives from the subset of alternatives that are available. Okay, so a general thing that is sometimes said, so for instance, uh, um, it's like Bill Boer, so a person, an economist who works on decision theory, once said that rationality requires that desirability should be independent of feasibility. So what you like should be independent of what's actually available. Of course, that is like many assumptions that we are discussing, of course. It is open for discussion, but I, um, I would not want to waste too much time on this and just take the basic assumptions as given and then try to, to do some interesting mathematics with those. But of course, anyth anything that you define in a model could be argued about. Okay, so that's, that's the main point. Um, now let's further develop this formalism. So, so far we just have this notion of a choice function, um, which is extremely simple. And uh, at many points, in particular on the last slide, I talked about like preferences and uh, taking the best alternatives according to your preferences. So like, let's make this more precise. So um, we will frequently talk about preference relations denoted by this symbol here um, on some universe, uh, on their universe U, so the universe is fixed. So it's a binary relation, um, and um, the symbol here, it's, it look like, looks like the greater or equal symbol, so it's just a curly version of that, just denotes that A is at least as good as B, so A, a is weakly preferred to B, so it's a weak preference relation. If we like A at least as much as B, we, we use this symbol here. Um, we assume that this preference relation is complete, okay, so, and for any two alternatives, A and B, we can say whether we weakly prefer A to B or, or B to A, or maybe both at the same time. Um, this is, again, just, just a basic assumption. Um, and we will also work with some relations later on in this course which are, which are not complete, but preference relations of individuals in this course will always be complete relations. Then we can define the strict part of this preference relation, which also, so it's really just I'm doing some, some basic uh, introduce or, or remind you of basic concepts um, about relations. So the strict preference, A is strictly preferred to B, is defined by saying that A is weakly preferred to B, and it's not the case that B is, B is weakly preferred to A. Okay, so it's, technically it's the asymmetric part of the relation. And we can also distill the indifference part of this. So we say that A is indifferent to B, um, or we are indifferent between A and B, that's I think the better saying. Um, and this is defined by having that A is weakly preferred to B and B is weakly preferred to A. I think this is basic enough, so I hope all of you are familiar with relations. So this weak preference relation is a reflexive relation, so X is at least as good as X itself. The strict part is an asymmetric relation, which means if we strictly prefer X to Y, then we cannot strictly prefer Y to X. Um, and the indifference relation is symmetric. Okay, so that means if, if we are indifferent between X and Y, we are also indifferent between Y and X. Um, so one thing that is also very straightforward, but uh, it will be useful from time to time, is that if we have two alternatives and we say that X is weakly preferred to Y, then this immediately implies 
that we cannot strictly prefer. Oh, <laughs> okay, now it happened. <laughs> that we can strictly prefer y to x. Okay, um, so I think that that's quite straightforward. And if we are talking about, com so this holds for any relation, even if it's not complete. So and if, it, if this relation is complete, this is an if and only if. So then the implication go goes in both directions. All right, let's go back to the slides. Okay. Um, okay, so here's some more notation. Um, so sometimes we are taking a preference relation or any, any kind of relation. So later on, we will also work with other types of relations and we are going to restrict it to a feasible set of alternatives. Okay, and, and this is just defined by the following intersection here. Um, because, so if you hopefully know from discrete structures or any basic math course, you took that a relation is just a set. So a function is just a set and a relation is just a set. And therefore we are sometimes in this course working with uh, relations as sets. For instance, if we define this notion here, we're just taking the intersection um, of A times A, which just gives exactly those pairs of alternatives which lie in the set A. Okay, so, so much on preference relations. And, and now we are defining a, a maximal set of alternatives given some preference relation. Yes? Uh, so for the complete definition, it should be f of u and not a, right? So it's like all x, y from a. And ah, a be good point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a typo. OK, so, so this, this a here should be a u. I'm going to change that before I upload the slides. So it's, it's for all alternatives, not for some. A hasn't been quantified. Thanks. Um, OK, so we want now to, to somehow be able to take maximal elements um, according to some feasible set of alternatives and the preference relation. OK, and, and this can be achieved by, taking, uh, by defining the following set here. So we have max of some preference relation and the feasible set. And that set contains uh, or consists of all alternatives x such that there is no alternative y which is strictly preferred to x. Okay, so we, if, if we have something in this set A such that there is nothing that is strictly better, then this is a maximal element. And now we can go, oh no, later on I show you that this is equivalent to, to another definition, but okay, so that, that's the definition of, of maximal elements. Um, okay, okay, so this is what I was talking about. Um, since our preference relation is complete, we could alternatively define maximal elements like this here. So we could just say all the alternatives x that are at least as good as all other alternative, as all alternatives y. Okay, so these two things are equivalent. Again, let's go back here to see why this is the case. So we take some alternative x um, in some feasible set. Okay, and then the, the second definition now said that for all alternatives y, x should be at least as good as y. Okay, and this implies because we have this thing up here, you're just adding the quantifiers here, that for all alternatives y, there is no, uh, for all, <laughs> yeah, for alter no alternative y is strictly preferred to x. Okay, so this direction always holds because of this thing here. And since we assume that preference relations are complete, we also have the other direction. So I think that is something, maybe let's do it in gray here. So the direction from right to left follows only because of completeness because, well, if, there is, if y is not strictly preferred to x, but we have to have some relationship between x and y, well, then x has to be weakly preferred to y. So the direction from right to left only holds for complete preferences. And the one from left to right holds, always holds, just by the definition. Okay. Let's go back to the slides. Okay, um, so c clearly the set of maximal elements uh, can contain more than one alternative, right? So for, can you think of an example where this is the case, where the set of maximal elements for some given relation in some feasible set contains more than one alternative? Yes? Right. 
Right, but how was the relation be defined then? So because in the example, I just, the, the example showed a choice function, right? So yeah. here I'm, I'm asking about the relation. Right, right. So, so if you have two alternatives and we are, we are indifferent between those, then both of them clearly are maximal because there's nothing that is strictly better. Um, okay, so there can be more than one maximal alternative. Is it also possible that the set of maximal elements is empty? Okay, I see you, but maybe somebody else. Um, you can think about it for some seconds. So, so far what we are assuming is that the preference relation is complete. So that's the only axiom that we are requiring from preference relations. Yes. I guess you could have a, a set of three endpoints, mm -hmm. maybe A, B, and C. Okay. And A is um, preferred to B, and B is preferred to C, and C is preferred to A. It doesn't make really much sense in the <laughs> Right, okay, so so far a preference relation only has to be a binary relation, it has to be complete. And what you said is A is, so here I'm already introducing notation that will be very useful, so which I think you have seen sometime already. So any, any relation, any binary relation can be very nicely represented as a directed graph. And here I'm drawing an edge from A to B if A is weakly preferred to B, okay? Um, and you said that A is preferred to B, B is preferred to C, C is preferred to A. Okay, so since this, so we have, let's be completely precise this time because we are introducing the formal framework. So this graph, if this depicts um, the weak preference relation, um, then we have to add some arrows here. Okay. Okay, so, but if, if we did this, um, so you're saying that we could have a double edge here, right? So it's an edge, but, but then we would be indifferent between A, B, and C, and then the set of maximal elements would not be empty, because then, then we would choose A, B, and C, right? So then if you're indifferent between A, B, and C, but some other edges have to be added just for the formalism to work, yes? We still need the reflexive. Um, exactly, right, so the reflexive edges, so, so A is weakly preferred to A, so I'm doing it today, so in, in some other lectures I'm, I'm not doing it because it's just annoying. <laughs> um, but so this speci completely specifies the relation. So in particular, it's important that we don't have the edges that you mentioned. So B is not weakly preferred to A because otherwise there would be indifference. Okay, because if, if, v would be, if B would be weakly preferred to A, so okay, let's, let's just do it for the sake of the example. Um, if we had this edge as well, um, what would the set of maximal elements contain? Yes? Uh, if you only do it for this one. A and B? Well, but A is not maximal because C is strictly better, right? So if, it's, if the relation looks like the red graph that I depicted here, so what would the set of maximal elements contain? So the, the definition of the set, so two equivalent definitions are still on the slide. So one thing we can do here is just we can go over all the alternatives and check whether they are maximal, right? So I, I already told you that A is not maximal because C is strictly better, right? C is not maximal because B is strictly better, okay? So how about B? Yes? B has outgoing edges to everything. So that is, B has outgoing edges to every other Right, person. okay, so, <laughs> so, so you, you were now using this, this definition, oops, sorry. <laughs> This definition here, but that's fine. So they're both equivalent. So, so I, wanted, I just wanted to make the point that B is a maximal element because there's nothing that is strictly better, right? So A is only indifferent to, a, uh, to B, and C well, is, is worse than B. So that's a maximal element, but you completely correctly said that B is a maximal element because it is at least as good as all the other alternatives. If something is only outgoing edges, it's a maximal element. Right? It doesn't matter whether these are double edges or, or single edges. Yes? Okay, um, so that's, that's why I denoted here, so this red graph here, so I also wanted to edit a blue one, so the red graph here depicts the weak preference relation, so every arrow that is not there is not in the relation, okay. 
Okay, so that means if we have an edge from A to B like here, and there's, it's not a double edge, it means strict preference. Yeah, but then those are also strict preference. Yeah, but I just removed the double arrow from between yeah, A and yeah. B. Yeah. So, but no, yeah, but now the, all these are strict preferences, yes, except for the reflexive arrows, of course. Um, so just to make this, so it seems like it's useful to be completely precise here. So we can also draw the strict part of the preference relation. So since we are talking about complete relations, so uh, we can get one relation from the other. So it's, it's redundant information. And in many cases, drawing only the strict part is more intuitive or is more helpful because then we have the strict edge here, another strict edge there. And we have this three cycle between A, B, C. There are no reflexive edges because clearly the, the strict part of the relation is not a reflexive relation, and that's it. Okay, so, so in, in all these cases, when we have like a graph of the weak relation, we can get the strict part, or from the strict part, we can get the weak part. So in most cases, it will be, it will be best to just draw the strict part. Okay. Everybody still with me? Okay. Um, right, and the reason why we did this stuff here on the right margin is because I was asking, is it possible that the set of maximal elements is empty? And uh, you constructed this example and said it seems a bit crazy or strange if, if somebody had preferences like these. Um, and, but if this is the case, if you prefer A to B and B to C and C to A, then the set of maximal elements is empty, and that means if we define a rational choice by somebody taking the best element from some set, this person cannot make a choice there. And this we want to avoid by imposing additional conditions on those preference relations. Okay, so so far we just assumed completeness. Um, but now we want to impose additional conditions in order to make sure that we can always take from every feasible set at least one alternative as a maximal element. Any guesses what kind of property might be useful now? to impose on the preference relation to avoid these kinds of cycles? Yes? Okay, yeah, so w one thing we could do is just we, we can say there should be no cycles in, in say, the, the blue graph here uh, of the strict preference relation. Yes? Transitivity is uh, another possibility. It turns out that these two things are different unless the preference relation is, is uh, assumed to be a, only a strict preference relation. Once we have ties, transitivity, and this acyclicity notion that you mentioned are two, are two different conditions. Um, but that is exactly yeah, what I wanted to hear. Um, so it seems like having some notion of transitivity or maybe avoiding cycles um, would be a useful condition for preference relations just because we want to be able to make choices. Okay. On. Okay, so let me just quickly restart the presentation here because something is fishy. Okay, now that looks better. Okay, so um, because of the, the reasons that I just explained, uh, preference relations usually assume some form of transitivity. <coughs> and it turns out there are like three uh, different forms, um, all of which make, make some sense. Um, the first one says, it's just standard transitivity. So we just say that the preference relation has to be transitive, which just means that if we weakly prefer x to y and weakly prefer y to z, then we should also weakly prefer x to z. So that's the standard transitivity notion that you're all familiar with, ideally. Um, then there's a, another condition, um, which is called quasi-transitivity. Um, and quasi-transitivity just means that we impose transitivity on the strict part of the preference relation. Okay, so at maybe at first sight it's not clear why these two are different uh, conditions. We are, we are going to look at examples. Um, but if you just syntactically look at the definitions, it's exactly the same, only that we use the strict part of the, of the preference relation. And then finally, that there's this condition that, that you mentioned, um, which is called acyclicity. And that is defined by saying there should be no cycles in the strict preference relation. Okay, so if, if you see this definition for the first time, maybe you, you are a bit confused by this because, well, for, for this acyclicity thing, we need more than three alternatives, so it's different from transitivity in this respect. So we have n different alternatives, and then we have that x1 is strictly preferred to x2 and so on, so we form a strict path from x1 to xn, and then here in the consequence we say that x1 should be weakly preferred to xn. Okay, so that maybe that 
that doesn't capture your intuitive understanding of acyclicity. But again, it, what is useful here is what I, what I denoted on this uh, whiteboard uh, um, a couple of minutes ago. So if we have that x1 is weakly preferred to xn, this implies that xn does not strictly, is not strictly preferred to, um, to x1. Okay, so and that just means we cannot close the cycle. So we have a path from x1 to xn, and then it should not be the case that there's a strict arrow from xn to x1, because if we had such an edge, then the cycle would be closed. Then we have a cycle. In this case, we only have a path. Yes? Um, so you mean why in the in the condition on the so in the in the last point here why we only say that x1 should be weakly preferred to xn? So that would be um, like too much of a consequence. So if we so of course we could define such a condition, but for, uh, in order not to have a cycle, it suffices that we do not have x1 is strictly preferred to x. Uh, uh, sorry, it should not be the case that xn is strictly preferred to x1. Um, if the condition that you sketched would mean that um, something would also count as a cycle if one of the edges is only a weak edge. Okay, um, and, and we don't want to consider this, but you could define a notion like this, but we only consider cycles if all these edges are strict edges. Okay. Um, so <laughs> these three conditions form a hierarchy. Um, so transitivity is the strongest notion. Quasi-transitivity is weaker. So I said maybe at first sight it's not clear why they are different at all. Um, we are going to see that and you are actually proving in your homework exercise or you are asked to prove, you don't have to, but uh, it would be good if you, if you can do that. Um, you, you prove that transitivity implies quasi-transitivity and quasi-transitivity implies acyclicity. Um, okay, so give you some seconds to internalize your, these definitions because I'm showing you some examples, but then maybe again you also have these notes with you which I, uh, which I wrote about in Moodle. Um, so let's look at these examples here. Um, so we are already familiarized with these notations here, so I'm drawing two directed graphs, one for the weak preference relation, one for the strict one, as I said earlier, so those are redundant. Um, but just to get a complete understanding of what preference relations are, I think it's, it's nice to look at both of these. Now, the question is, for this particular example here, so that's a preference relation on three alternatives, what kinds of transitivity or acyclicity does it satisfy? So we have three of these different conditions. So which notions are satisfied and which ones are not satisfied? Maybe, so maybe let's start with the weakest one. Okay, so is this relation acyclic? Okay, maybe you? Uh, yes. It is acyclic, right? And wh why is that the case? Maybe just a brief. Uh, because we have to check only in the strong um, side and there aren't any circles. Exactly, so no, no cycles here. There's just a single edge in the strict preference relation, that's right. So, so some of you, when I ask, is it acyclic, um, um, I think sh shook their head because they probably thought that there are weak preference cycles here, but the definition of acyclicity just means there should be no cycles in the strict part of the preference relation. So it, so it is acyclic. Um, Quasi-transitivity, is this relation quasi-transitive? Not sure whether that's too easy or too difficult. <laughs> yes, you okay. You're yes. about to raise your hand, so. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, it's transitive because it talks about the strong part. Uh, and we also only have uh, one connection. And exactly, right. So quasi transitivity is again just a property that uses the strict part of the preference relation. and. It, it would not be quasi-transitive if we, we did at least two different edges in this red graph here for failing quasi-transitivity. So therefore, it is quasi-transitive. Um, and finally, transitivity. So is this relation transitive? So now we also have to take into account this graph here. Yes? Uh, no, it's not because there is a connection from A to C and from C to B, but no connection from B to A. From A to C? Yeah. And? C to B. C to B? And the implication would be that then also B to A has to be. Mm. 
So it is not transitive, but if, if well, there's an edge from A to C. Ah, okay, so yeah, okay, so we have an edge, so A, okay, so because transitivity, if we have, if, if A is weakly preferred to C, and C is weakly preferred to B, then A should be weakly preferred to B, which it is, but you, okay, you are reading the edges in the wrong, yes, yes, okay, so then, how does it work then? Uh, <laughs> Exactly. Right. So we we have a weak preference here, weak preference here, but we don't have a weak preference here because if there's a strict preference from A to B, there can be no weak preference from B to A. Okay. So therefore, this example shows that the relate. Whoops. The relation is quasi-transitive. Okay. And including your homework, that that means it's also acyclic because you're showing that this uh, that this is implied. But. Uh, um, but it's not transitive. Okay. Um, so that, that, for instance, are already shows that the first two conditions, so you're going to show that it's an implication, and this shows that they are not equivalent, because the implication might leave open the possibility that both notions are uh, the same. But this example is the smallest example which shows that this is not the case. Next, this one here. Um, I guess that should be a good, should go a bit quicker now. So is it acyclic, this relation? Yes, right, so no cycle in the red graph. Is it quasi-transitive? Uh, yes? Yeah, yeah but it's, so if, if it were quasi-transitive, so if there's an edge from A to B and one from B to C, there should also be one from A to C, which is not there. Okay. And, and therefore, it fails quasi-transitivity. Okay. And um, well, if, if it fails quasi-transitivity, of course, it also fails transitivity. Well, not of course, but that's if, if you take the solution of your homework as granted. Um, if you know this is a hierarchy, then this means that this thing here is acyclic, but not quasi-transitive. Okay. So I hope we, we now have a better understanding of these three notions here. Um, as I said, they form a hierarchy. And now we are going to show uh, the, the first lemma here. Um, and this lemma shows, uh, maybe I shouldn't have revealed it so early, is perhaps surprisingly. So, so if we go back to why we were inter interested in these notions of transitivity in the first place, was we want always the set of maximal elements to be non-empty. Okay? And this lemma here is a complete characterization under which circumstances all uh, maximal, uh, maximal sets from every feasible set are non-empty. Under which circumstances can we always take a maximal element? And it turns out that this is the case if and only if the preference relation is acyclic. So the weakest of these conditions is necessary and sufficient for always picking a maximal element. Okay, so I said that maybe perhaps surprisingly because acyclicity out of these three notions is perhaps the, the one that is least known. So usually you, you perhaps think that maybe transitivity is, is required. Um, so if you have transitivity, of course, acyclicity is also satisfied, but transitivity is a bit too strong. So this characterization here says that, it's, um, that acyclicity is precisely the condition that we are using here. Just by the way, because I remember last time there were some students who had difficulty understanding these things here. So if with two Fs means if and only if. So that means an implication that goes both directions. And I'm also using quantifiers like for all exists. So if you have never seen them before, then you need to to recap some things before the next lecture. So I don't have enough time to go over these things here, but I hope all of you are familiar with those. Okay, so in this theorem, uh, I'm proving, um, just to save a little bit of time, I already wrote down what we are going to prove. And uh, in this course, we are frequently proving complete characterizations, or if and only if statements. Um, and the way you usually prove these is that you first show one direction, uh, for instance, the one from left to right, and then the other direction from right to left. So there are some examples where you can show both directions at the same time if they are particularly simple statements. We, have, we will have one of these in today's lecture. But for this statement here, 
let's prove both directions independently from each other. Okay, so this is my way of saying that we first prove the direction from left to right. Okay, so direction from left to right means, so we now assume that the left-hand side is true, so we assume that for every feasible set, the set of maximal elements is non-empty, and then we want to show um, that the preference relation that we have here is acyclic. Okay, so if we want to show that the preference relation is acyclic, because that, that's the goal that we want to show in this part of the proof, we first take um, a subset of alternatives, x1 to xn, such that we have these strict preferences from x1 to x2 to x3, so a path like in the definition of acyclicity. And then the final step that we need to show is that this uh, path cannot be closed, such that we have a cycle. Okay, so we start with some set of alternatives, let's call it b. Um, and those here are x1 to xn. So my one is just a vertical bar, so sometimes it's a bit confusing because it looks like a comma, but here, so there's first the one and then the comma. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have a strict preference from x1 to x2, and so on, so exactly like in the definition of acyclicity, so if, if you have these definitions in front of you, you can look at the definition of acyclicity to see why we are doing this. Um, Oops. Uh, come on. No, maybe not and, but okay. So, so we take this set of alternatives. We have these strict preferences between these alternatives. And now we have to use something from the left-hand side because this implication of acyclicity holds under what we have on the left-hand side. So we know that for every feasible set, the set of maximal elements is non-empty. So Clearly, it seems natural to now take this feasible set B, and we know that from the feasible set B, at least one alternative is maximal. Or in other words, the set of maximal elements is non-empty. Okay, so that is the assumption. And now we want to prove um, that these alternatives x1 to xn do not form a cycle. Okay, so if the set of maximal elements is non-empty, so at least one alternative is maximal. We can, just as we did earlier when I was asking about maximal elements in these examples, I was saying that you can just check for all the different alternatives which one could be maximal. Okay, so let's say for instance here, so can xn be the maximal element in this set B? Is that possible? Okay, so you were first, yeah. All right, okay, so xn cannot be maximal because in this feasible set there's something that is strictly better. xn minus 1 is strictly better. Okay, so can xn minus 1 be a maximal element in this set? Okay, so which one is better? <laughs> you can just shout it in. So. X1? X1? Mm, that we don't know. Right, so we, we are now at xn minus 1, and x1 is here, but we don't know the relationship between x1 and xn minus 1. So which alternative is strictly better than xn minus 1? Yes? Xn minus 2. Yeah, xn minus 2, right? So we have this path here. So that means x, xn we cannot choose, xn minus 1 we cannot choose, xn minus 2 we cannot choose. So there are lots of alternatives that are ruled out. So which one is the only remaining possibility for a maximal element in this feasible set? X1, right? So X1 is the only one for which we, at least we don't know that it is strictly dominated. Uh, so I will sometimes use the term dominance when I say about preference. Um, okay, so the only possibility is X1. Um, we don't know the preference relation completely, but from what we know about the preference relation, X1 is the only remaining possibility. So it has to be the singleton um, if we take the maximal element from, from this set B. Okay, but now clearly uh, maybe let's take the alternative definition of maximality now. So something is maximal if it is at least as good as all the other alternatives. So that implies that x1 is at least as good as xn. Okay, and that is exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, if you look at the definition of acyclicity, it states if we have something like this here, 
So we have this path of strict preference. Then the first element should be weakly preferred to the last one. Or in other words, the last element cannot be strictly preferred to the first one, because otherwise there would be a cycle. Okay, so that already proves the direction from left to right. So we have assumed that in every feasible set we have a maximal element, and therefore the preference relation has to be acyclic. Okay, now the other direction, unless there's a question regarding these two lines. Okay. Oh, this is so annoying. So I I guess some of you have pencils as well, right? So it's, I, I never activated this thing where you can double tap to have an eraser because I found it annoying at some point, and I just activated it yesterday because I thought it would be handy for the lecture. But now all the time I'm accidentally switching between pencil and eraser. It's, <laughs> so I'm going to change it in the break. Okay, direction from right to left. Um, okay, now we assume that we have a preference relation which is acyclic. So a preference relation that doesn't contain a cycle. Um, and the consequence that we want to show is that from every feasible set, we can pick at least one maximal alternative. Okay, and in order to show this, so we want to show that this holds for every feasible set, so we just take an arbitrary feasible set. So we let A be in this F of U. Um, And the next thing that we try is, okay, so we want to show that in this feasible set there's at least one maximal element. So let's just take some random element x1 from this feasible set. Okay, so what I'm proving here, so maybe, uh, maybe some mathematicians will find offense with this, uh, because I, I, usually you prove this by induction, so it's like a, like a simplified induction or a different kind of induction that I'm going to do here, because I think it's more intuitive. But Formally, if you spell it out completely, you would usually use an induction proof. But let's use this uh, hopefully more intuitive argument. So we take this random element x1. So if x1 is a maximal element, then we are done, right? Because we want to show that in this feasible set, there is a maximal element. If we have found something that is contained um, in the set of maximal elements here, then of course the maximal set is non-empty because we have found an element here. Okay, so in this case, we would be done if the answer is yes here. If the answer is not yes here, what do we know? If x is not a maximal element, what can we say, uh, x1 is not a maximal element, what do we know about x1? Yes, so that there's another element that is strictly preferred. Okay, so there has to be some x, y, um, in the set, in the remaining set of alternatives, of course it cannot be x1 itself, and this x y uh, x2, sorry, x2 is strictly preferred to x1. Okay, now we are repeating the same kind of argument. Okay, so maybe this one is a maximal element. Okay, if the answer is yes, again we are done. If the answer is no, there has to be some alternative x3. It cannot be any of the previous two alternatives. And x3 also has to be strictly preferred to x1. Okay, and we keep on doing this. So now we, we can ask the question, maybe x3 is the maximal element. It, now the th this step becomes more interesting because with x3, it could be the case that it's not maximal because it is strictly dominated by x1. Right? So something that we already have in the set of alternatives that we, were, that we were exhausting here. But once that is the case, there would be a cycle. Okay? And we are assuming acyclicity here. So this is where we are assuming the assumption, or where we are, we are using the assumption of acyclicity. So basically here, this is always possible because of acyclicity. Acyclicity, is this right? I guess. Um, Okay, so and then this is where it becomes a bit hand wavy. So this you can see this as a formal induction. Um, just let me complete the argument, and then you can ask the question. Um, and uh, the other thing that we know about the feasible set, except that the preference relation is not um, is not cyclic, is, is that the set of feasible uh, that the feasible set contains a finite number of alternatives. Okay, because if we had an infinite number of alternatives, the sequence of dominations could go on and on forever. So an important part that we are using now is that the feasible set is of finite size, and therefore there has to be some alternative xi 
where we stop. So we cannot keep on doing this forever. And then the answer, so in this simplified proof notation, would be yes at some point. So we, we have to find this, this process somehow has to end at some point because we only have a finite number of alternatives. Yes? Uh, X, I'm not sure whether I got it, what? Yes? And you, okay, so you, your question, if I got it right, was whether it's not only necessary that we have a weak preference here? Um, okay, but um, that doesn't suffice because the assumption in this case, if you want to call it that way, is that um, x2 is not a maximal element, and an element is not maximal if it is strictly preferred by something else. So this is the, follows from the definition of maximality. So we have to have something else which is strictly better. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. OK, thanks. Yeah, OK. <laughs> maybe, maybe that also led to your confusion. So that is a typo here. So I meant x3 is strictly preferred to x2. So. Yes? Okay. So this one here. Okay. So why why we are making this assumption here? Yeah. Okay. So we want to show um, acyclicity. So we are now back in the direction from left to right. And if you look at the condition of acyclicity, it's an implication. Okay, so if it, it says, the definition of acyclicity says, whenever this is the case, then that should also be the case. Okay, so in order to disprove acyclicity, then we have to make this assumption here and prove that this always follows. Okay, yes? Um, will you only upload slides or will you also upload ah. notes? Yeah, I forgot to mention this. I'm uploading those notes as well. Um, so, yeah, some, some of you or some students I know still prefer or uh, to still write down the things during the lecture, maybe because I maybe sometimes mention something that, that might be useful, but I'm uploading what I'm writing down on, on this app after the lecture. Okay. Um, okay, so this final step here completed the proof of the direction from right to left, and we have shown the complete statement now that um, the set of maximal elements is always non-empty if and only if the preference relation is acyclic. And that's important to know because especially later then also when we are talking about social choice, um, it's, it's nice to know that um, acyclicity is necessary and sufficient for always making choices from any feasible set. Okay, back to this here. Um, Okay, rationalizable choice. Again, we need to restart here. Um, okay, so now the next thing that we are doing is, is um, so we have, so far we have introduced preference relations and we have a choice function, okay? Um, but the thing is that we don't know the preferences of an individual decision maker. But what we can observe, if we observe somebody making decisions or making choices, is the choice function. So we can offer somebody like lots of different dessert menus and see what this person is doing. Um, so that we can observe, but it's, uh, we cannot really observe the preferences of somebody. And therefore we are introducing the notion of rationalizable choice, where the idea is um, we don't know the actual preference relation that this decision maker is using to pick maximal elements, um, but we can say that a choice function, not a preference relation, but a choice function is rationalizable if there is some underlying preference relation according to which maximal elements are always chosen. Okay, so a choice behavior, which is formally a choice function, can be rationalizable if there is some underlying preference relation which completely explains the choice behavior of this person. So that, that's the underlying idea of rationalizability. Um, so a choice function S is rationalizable if there exists a binary relation 
a preference relation, um, such that from every feasible set, the maximal elements are chosen according to this preference relation. Okay, so um, that, for instance, if we had in the beginning, we had this example, for instance, where we had this, that this woman made uh, crazy choices from this dessert menu, uh, from two different dessert menus, actually. So maybe this notion of rationalizability helps by saying that there is no possible preference relation which explains her choice behavior. And it turns out that this is, this is actually true. Um, um, and that's why we are using this notion of rationalizability. So at, at this point, it may seem very difficult to say whether a choice function is rationalizable or not, because, well, you have this choice function, which can be represented as a table. We have seen some examples earlier. But then in order to check whether a choice function is rationalizable, we need to check all possible underlying preference relations and check whether they rationalize this choice function. Right? So we can enumerate all possible preference relations, and there are many of those. There's an exponential number of those in the number of alternatives, and check whether they rationalize it with the given choice function. Um, so this extremely inefficient method can be greatly improved by narrowing down uh, the choice for a rationalizing relation. Any ideas of what, what we could do here? Because in principle, there's an like extremely large number of possible underlying rationalizing relations. And the, the important clue is that um, so we take the maximum elements for all feasible sets. Okay? So, we, um, so this same rationalizing relation has to work for all possible feasible sets. So, and there are some particular feasible sets which help a lot to narrow down the search for a rationalizing relation. Yes? You can start building the um, graph of, like the, of the preference relations, and then from the uh, mean preference, we can build a fixed term graph, and then we can check. But where, where do we get this uh, preference relation from? Right? So because you, we know that the choice of A is the maximum, maximum set, right? So we get information that everything that is fixed is ah, the ah, okay. to the other okay. information, so we can just convert yes. that as that into a graph. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, or immediately, uh, always, you can build the string subset, uh -huh. string graph, and then check whether that is a or not. Okay, so, so that is something we could do. So we could just look at all the different feasible sets, and then if something is chosen, we know that it's weakly preferred to everything else in the feasible set, um, and that gives us lots of edges for this graph. Um, but that's actually, so that's definitely true, but there's something else I had in mind, which I, I guess is a bit simpler even. Yes? Exactly, exactly, right? So because this has to work for all feasible sets, including feasible sets of size 2, okay? And with feasible sets of size 2, something always has to be chosen. So there are three different possibilities. If we have x and y, we choose x, we choose y, or we choose both of them. And that immediately gives us the preference, so the, the rationalizing preference relation of this choice function, if there is any, right? So um, in other words, so the only candidate for a rationalizing relation is um, what is in the literature called the base relation. So the base relation is defined by looking at the choices from pairs of alternatives. And, and that greatly, greatly simplifies the process. So we only need to look at the choices from pairs and then check whether this relation rationalizes the choice function. Um, okay, so this is how the base relation is defined. So it's denoted by this um, preference symbol with subscript S because it depends on a choice function. So now we have a choice function as given. So we have a choice function S as given. And then we define a preference relation. Um, I don't know how to call this. Greater or equal S, um, which is defined by saying that X is chosen from the two elements at X, Y. If that is the case, then X is weakly preferred to Y. And as I just said, so there are in total three different possibilities. If we have only two alternatives, it could also be the case that y is chosen or both of these are chosen. But the empty set is not a possibility. And therefore, we have these three different types of preferences. Weak preference going uh, indifference or strict preference in going, going in one of these directions. OK. Um, let's see. So it's, let me just quickly do this proof um, before the break. Um, because I basically already outlined. So I think the discussion that we just had and the idea that you had basically already outlined why this has to be the case. I think maybe most of you are already convinced that the base relation is the only relation that can rationalize a choice function. But again, we want to make this completely precise, and that's why I'm writing down the proof. But it's, it's much shorter than the proof of the previous lemma that we had. Um, okay, so we want to show that a choice function is rationalizable if and only if it is rationalizable by the base relation. 
Okay. Um, first, again, direction from left to right. Okay, so we know that the choice function is rationalizable, and now we want to show, and I'm, and I'm basically just formalizing the argument that you already gave. Um, we want to show that this rationalizing relation has to be the base relation. Okay, so in this proof here, so I'm not writing down quantifiers, so we take two arbitrary alternatives, x and y, and this here is the rationalizing relation that we have. If we assume the left-hand side, there has to be some rationalizing relation, we just denote it by this symbol here. Okay, so if x is weakly preferred to y, that also means that x is among the maximal elements according to this very relation in the two element set x, y. Okay, so this is really just the definition of the max function. Okay, now we know that this relation, um, so I mean this relation here, so that this is rationalizing the choice function s. And because this is the case, we know that x not only is in the set of maximal elements, but it's also in the set of elements chosen by s. Okay. Okay, so that means here we are using that um, this relation is rationalizing s. Okay, and um, well, now we are already al almost done with the first direction here. So if x is chosen from the two elements at x, y, so unfortunately I cannot show the slides at the, at the same time here, um, you would see that this is precisely the definition of the base relation. Okay, so if x is chosen from this two element set, this is exactly how we define the base relation of s. And therefore, what we have shown now is if we have a rationalizing relation, this rationalizing relation is the same as the base relation. Okay. So depending on your level of, of mathematics, so maybe it gives you more insight, uh, but maybe also the intuitive argument already convinced you. But this is how you would formally prove this kind of statement. Um, it's only the first half, but the other half is completely trivial, right? So the direction from right to left. Okay, but it's the only thing is here, here what we, okay, so maybe it's a bit misleading here, right? So I, I omitted some things by saying, so, so this relation is the rationalizing relation. So we showed that if there is a rationalizing relation, it has to be the base relation. Okay, but for the other direction, um, so it's, it's a different kind of, of series of implications, but the other direction is completely obvious. Um, because if something is rationalized by the base relation, well, when do, when, then we do have a rationalizing relation, the base relation. Okay, so that's that's really. So even if for homeworks or exams or something, in these kinds of cases, you can really just write it's trivial, right? So the R, uh, not R. Uh, so so this thing here is the rationalizing relation. Therefore, we are done here. All right. Um, that completes this proof here, and I promise that we are going to have the break now. Um, so let's have this 15 minute break. So right before the break, uh, we finished proving this uh, rather simple statement that if something is rationalizable, it can be only through the base relation. So which greatly simplifies this, this notion of rationalizability. Um, now, come on. So if we, if we think about this initial example that we have uh, with, with the dessert uh, choice, with uh, you choose apple pie from ABC, A from ABC, and if there's only apple pie and brownies, you choose brownies. Um, we can now see why, so because we, th we said intuitively this doesn't seem like a rational choice, and we can now formally say why this is not rational, because such a choice function is not rationalizable. Okay? So in this case, we cannot really construct uh, the entire base relation because we know only two choices. Okay? We, we don't know the choice from every feasible set, but still, um, the example shows that this is, uh, cannot be rationalized by any relation. And why is that the case? So we can basically take your method of constructing the, the rationalizing relation. So we know from the first set, A, B, C, if A is chosen, A has to be a maximal element. Okay? And that means that A, according to this rationalizing relation, is at least as good as B. Okay, because everything that is maximal is at least as good as any other alternative. So that statement I'm using all the time. Um, but now, um, if from this smaller feasible set A, B, B is chosen, okay, so we know that B is at least as good as A, um, but we also know, because A is not chosen, 
that some alternative has to be strictly better than A. Okay? And since there's only two alternatives here, it has to be B. So if, if from this two element set we only choose B, A has, to be, uh, A has to be strictly dominated by B. Or in other words, B has to be strictly better than A. Okay, so this is what we know from this choice here, and this is what we get to know from this choice here. And those two statements, of course, are, are incompatible with each other. So it's, it's impossible that we weakly prefer A to B and strictly prefer B to A. Yes? No, it's not. Okay, so that's a, that's a good point because somebody in the break asked me something similar. So I realize now that maybe a tiny drawback of having this relation symbol here, um, rather than having, previously I said we had these letters R, P, and I for preference relations, is that you read transitivity in it. So you may think that if A is chosen uniquely, it has to be strictly better than all the other alternatives. Okay, because if this symbol here would be just the greater or equal sign for natural numbers, for instance, that would be the case. So if, if there's only a unique maximal number, then it has to be strictly better than everything else. But that is, um, so we only get the strict preference here if the underlying rationalizing relation would be transitive. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that this, that this notation of using this curly greater or equal sign maybe fools you into assuming that this relation has to be transitive, but it doesn't have to be. So in some cases we, we make the assumption of transitivity, in others we don't. But here we are, we are just saying it cannot be rationalized by any function, even without assuming transitivity or even acyclicity or anything like that. Okay, so th I think that's an important point to make. So whenever we have these kinds of relations here, they don't have to be transitive, and therefore if an element is the unique maximal element, it doesn't have to be strictly better than all the other ones, only weakly. Okay, because we have, see, we have seen these examples on three alternatives before the break um, of relations which are um, not transitive where this is the case. Yes? Okay, so why B is strictly better than A here? Uh, yes? Okay, because if only B is chosen, um, it means that A is not chosen. Okay, so A is... <laughs> okay. So uh, let me just uh, complete the sentence. Maybe somebody else uh, wants to know it. So it's if <laughs> A has to be strictly dominated by something, and the only option is B, right? So because it's a two-element set. Okay. So if 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 A is not is not a maximal element, something else has to be strictly better. Okay. So therefore, we know that um, there is no way that there is a rationalizing relation for this choice function, which which somehow formalizes uh, our intuition that we had earlier. Um, and this also, I think this example also nicely leads to what we are going to do next, because I said in the beginning, so we are talking about rationality and rationalizability, so that we are maximizing something according to an underlying preference relation, and we want to relate these kinds of conditions to consistency conditions. Okay? And if you think about this particular example, it seems like um, a fairly simple consistency condition is already violated here. Consist by consistency, I mean that we are directly relating choices from one feasible set to choices in another feasible set. Um, so for instance, you could define the condition, which we are going on the next slide, which says that if something is chosen from some feasible set, like A is chosen here, then this alternative should also be chosen in every feasible subset in which it is contained. Okay, so and, and this intuitively is also what's going wrong in the dessert example. So if you think that apple pie is among your, among your most favorite desserts, then it should also be among your most favorite desserts in, every, in any feasible subset which offers apple pie. Okay? Um, this condition is called contraction consistency, and we will now relate it to rationalizability. Because here, the nice thing about the example here is that um, so consistency conditions allow us to show non-rationalizability by just pointing out two different choices. So we say if, if we choose A here and we don't choose A here, then this contraction consistency condition that I'm going to define is violated. And that already, as we will see later, um, means that it cannot be rationalized by any relation. Okay, so I already revealed that this condition is called contraction consistency. Um, that I already said. So in general, consistency conditions are now conditions on choice functions. So it's not properties of relations or something. We are just saying that a choice function satisfies a consistency condition if for certain feasible sets um, um, some, some relationships hold. So more concretely, contraction consistency, which is also denoted by alpha. Okay, so alpha is, uh, so there are a couple of so-called Greek letter properties, as some students call them. Um, contraction consistency is also called alpha, and it means that if we have two different feasible sets, A and B, and B is a subset of A, 
then everything that is best or that is chosen from A and also happens to be in B also needs to be chosen from B. Okay, so this is precisely the intuition that we described earlier. So if X is chosen in a feasible set, then it should also be chosen in all subsets that contain X. Um, do you have oh, something that I can show you here? Okay, so just to, to see what this condition precisely means in terms of a Venn di diagram. So we have two different feasible sets, A and B. And now the orange set is the choice set from A, so it's what we are choosing from A, and the green set is what we are choosing from B. Okay, and now I want to show you what, what this condition here actually means. Um, by moving this around here, so now these sets can, can overlap. Now here we say that B has to be a subset of A. Okay, it has to be somewhere in here. And everything that is chosen from A and also happens to be in B should be chosen from B as well. So if I, if I place it like this, then the condition is satisfied. If I place it, place it like this, then the condition is not satisfied, right? Because there are alternatives that are chosen from A, um, which also happen to be in B, but they are not chosen from B. Okay, so it has to be exactly like this, or something like this. Okay, so that, that's the condition alpha. Okay. Um, Okay, so at, at this point, contraction consistency just seems like a use, useful condition to impose on choice functions, right? So if something is chosen from a set, then it should also be chosen from all the subsets. Um, but the nice thing is, is that we are going to relate it to rationalizability. Um, and in particular, what we need for rationalizability in the first place, so if something can only be rationalized, as we have seen in the lemma before the break, it, if it can be rationalized by the base relation, so one necessary condition for rationalizability is that the base relation doesn't contain any cycles, right? Because if the base relation has a strict cycle, well, then we know that we cannot choose from this feasible set that contains of all the consists of all the alternatives on the cycle. Okay, so a necessary condition for rationalizability, um, it's, it's not a sufficient one, as we will see, is that there are no cycles in the base relation. And it turns out, ah, okay, let's just skip this for a second. <laughs> It turns out that this is precisely what alpha implies. So if a choice function satisfies alpha, then its base relation is acyclic. Okay, so and, and therefore um, alpha seems already to, to prove like some part of rationalizability. So at least that the base relation is acyclic. Okay, but before we get there, um, let me... It's, it's, this is a bit like a look ahead of wh where all this is leading to because in, in the end we want to talk about social choices and what we are doing is, is that um, similar to what we have in the example here, we are applying these consistency conditions and also rationalizability conditions to social choices. And one simple thing that you could do for instance, you can check whether plurality satisfies alpha. Okay? And then it depends on how you actually define plurality when there are different feasible sets of alternatives. So the idea here is that we have preferences over all alternatives in the universe. Um, and then whenever we have a feasible set, we just restrict the preference profile to the alternatives in the feasible set. We compute the plurality scores, and then we pick the alternatives with the highest score. Okay, so that means that for a fixed preference profile, we have a choice function. And for this choice function, we can check whether it satisfies contraction consistency or any other condition that we are going to define. Um, and here, um, let's see why Plurality, for instance, in, in this example, um, does not satisfy alpha. So if the feasible set consists of all three alternatives, A, B, and C, so now we are doing what we did in the last lecture, well, then the unique pl plurality winner is alternative A. Okay, so it has a score of three, so A will be selected uniquely. If, however, we narrow down the feasible set to alternatives A and B, so that means C is just, just not there. So you just have to imagine that the Cs are gone here, then you recompute the plurality scores, then the score of B becomes four, right? These two here and these two here, so it's, it's more than A has. So that means from this two element set, alternative B is chosen, okay? And this, by the way, is exactly the same example as the crazy woman who chooses from a dessert menu, right? So you choose A from ABC and you choose B from AB. So that shows that plurality is, is violated. So it seems like contraction consistency is perhaps a rather demanding condition. And uh, last time I was bashing plurality quite a bit. Um, and it turns out that uh, it's not only plurality, but basically any, any social choice function that uh, satisfies very mild conditions has to violate alpha. But that is something that we are going to, to, 
to look at in more detail in the upcoming lecture. So this is just like a little look ahead to see why we are, in, in which context we are also going to apply these consistency conditions later on in this course. All right. Um, but now um, I'm going to show, to prove lemma three. So, and the lemma three says that if a choice function satisfies alpha, then the base relation is acyclic. Okay, and again, this is a necessary condition for being rationalizable because if we have cycles, the base relation is the only candidate for a rationalizing relation. If it has a cycle, then we are screwed. So that's why, why this is quite useful. So I'm going to prove this theorem and a oh, lemma, it's only a lemma, and then we have this main theorem, but the proof of this is not much longer than the other ones, and, and that's it for proofs today, because I know that, especially when it's getting later and later, then proofs can be a bit exhausting, sometimes also for me. <laughs> um, so where is it? So that one we have already. Okay. But as, especially, I think, for the first lecture, it's quite important, because uh, for the upcoming exercises, I try to... Um, hopefully, maybe, maybe the tutors will disagree, uh, to set an example of how proofs should be written down, because um, we also want that in the exercises and in the exam, sometimes we have proof questions that you write down proofs um, in a formal way and not just by arguing um, about why the statement should be true. Okay, so if a choice function satisfies alpha, then the base relation is acyclic. So this is an implication, um, and implications can be nicely shown via contraposition. Okay, so if A implies B, this is equivalent to saying that not B implies not A. Okay, so that hopefully, if, if, you, if you didn't know this, then uh, remember it, it's very useful in many cases. Um, if you want to show an implication, in many cases it's useful to show that the negation of the consequence implies the negation of the, this is called the antecedent, but uh, yeah. This is just some, some basic logic thing, and in particular for this kind of statement it's useful because um, the negation of the base relation is acyclic, it's just the base relation contains a cycle, and that's much easier to work with because then we have an object to work with. So you can just take the cycle and then do something with it. Okay, so that's why for this statement, um, contraposition um, is quite useful. So in contraposition means that we are showing that if the base relation is cyclic, then S violates alpha, okay? So which is the negation. Um, okay. So first, um, we just formally define the cycle here. Okay, so the only thing that we know about the space relation is, is that there's a cycle. So we have x1 to xn. Oh, maybe a bit nicer. Um, and then on these alternatives in this feasible set, we do have a cycle. So x1, according to the base relation, is strictly preferred to x2 and so on until we have xn. Okay, and then because this will be useful later on, let's also define xn to be the same thing as x0. And this one uh, is strictly better than x1. So that completes the cycle. And this always has to be the base relation, so we have little s's here. Okay, so what I write down now is just that, I, that there's a cycle, a strict cycle according to the base relation. Um, okay. Uh, ah, okay, now I know. Next thing that we are doing is, is we take this choice function. The only thing we know about it is that it satisfies alpha, but we don't even need that at the first, for the first step. So, the choice function has to return something for the feasible set A, okay? Because a choice function, by definition, always yields a non-empty set of alternatives. So there has to be some alternative that is returned here, okay? Um, so let's just assume, so it has to be one of these xi's, that this is xi, uh, so there is some i such that xi is contained in S of A. Okay, so here I'm just using non-emptiness um, of the choice sets returned by the choice function. Okay, um, so far we don't have a contradiction um, with, uh, with alpha or something, um, but that is what we are going to aim for. Um, and uh, that means at some point, uh, like here, uh, we have to use alpha, and now the idea is that by alpha we can restrict the feasible set A to some subset here. Okay. Um, 
So we are now using alpha and reduce the set. And then the consequence of alpha is, is if xi is chosen from this large set, it's also chosen in, in, in any smaller set, in particular all two element sets. Um, and here we use that xi has to be contained in the two element set consisting of xi minus 1 and xi. Okay, so this is, this is the important part because that is exactly where we're using alpha. So if, if some alternative is chosen in a feasible set, it's also chosen in any subset in which it is contained. In particular, if we add this alternative, if, if we only have xi and xi minus 1. Okay, and here you can already see why we have a contradiction um, because we know that xi minus 1 is preferred to xi according to the base relation, right? So this is just exactly what we have written down here. We have this cycle going from um, x1 to xn, and which then closes. Um, therefore, xi minus 1 is strictly preferred to xi according to the base relation. And how is the base relation defined? Well, the base relation is defined as choices from pairs. And that means that from this two element set, xi minus 1, xi, Um, we can only pick xi minus 1. Okay, but that is a contradiction because we have just, we just said that xi is chosen and here we said that xi minus 1 is the unique chosen element. And since this singleton set, to make it really completely precise, does not contain xi, we have a contradiction. Okay, so first we showed that xi has to be among the chosen elements because of alpha but this is in contradiction to what we assumed about the base relation here because xi minus 1 is the unique chosen element. All right, so maybe some of these proofs you, you need to go over them at home again to really completely internalize them. Um, but the nice thing is I think with all of this in choice theory is that most of these arguments are fairly straightforward. So most of these proofs are just three, four, five lines um, and they are just very simple, basic logic arguments. You, you don't need any advanced mathematics in order to follow these arguments. You only need to be careful um, not to mix up these, these different notions. So to think what is the rationalizing relation, what is the base relation, what does alpha exactly mean. So I guess um, this may take some time to getting used to these conditions. Okay, but what that already implies is that alpha uh, uh, makes sure that the base relation is acyclic, okay? And we also know from, I think it was lemma one, uh, two, uh, lemma two showed that if something can be rationalized, it can only be rationalized by the base relation. Therefore, it may seem um, that alpha already completely gives us rationalizability, right? So we, we know that the base relation is the only candidate and now alpha proves that the base relation cannot contain any cycles. So we, can have, we, ha we will have a maximal element according to the base relation in all feasible sets. Nevertheless, I already said earlier, so alpha is not um, necessary and sufficient for rationalizability. Any ideas why this doesn't suffice um, if the base relation is acyclic? Okay, so we, we know that something can be rationalized only by the base relation. Um, and we know the base relation doesn't contain any cycles, but still I'm saying that it's not sufficient for, for rationalizability. Yes? Isn't this example also a cyclic uh, or a few examples? Uh, because there isn't any chain of dominations, nothing dominates anything, right? Nothing dominates anything? Um, Well, no, A strict, according, to which, if, according to the base relation, A strictly dominates B, for instance, right? Because from the pair AB, we are only choosing... Uh, B strictly dominates A, I'm sorry. So B strictly dominates A because from the pair AB, we are only choosing B and not A. All right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so but what I was aiming for is that... Um, even though it's necessary that the base relation doesn't contain any cycles, it's still possible that the base relation just doesn't rationalize the choice function that we have in mind. Right? So because um, we, can always make, we can always pick maximal elements from every feasible set, but the important condition for rationalizability is that the set of maximal elements coincides with what the choice function does. 
And I'm going to show you an example where this is actually the case. Um, and this will lead to another consistency condition called expansion. Okay, so let's maybe draw the rationalizing. So maybe that's also a nice exercise because it's related to what, what you said. So we have a choice function here and now let's look at the base relation. Um, okay, so let's draw A, B and C. So between A and B, um, we have like indifference. Um, also uh, both of these are chosen from the two element set. From B and C, we are only choosing B. And from A and C, we are only choosing A, okay? And then this is the base relation. Almost used the wrong symbol. <laughs> uh, it's pretty ugly when I draw on the keynote slides, but there are no different pen sizes here. Um, okay, so first, uh, I'm I claiming here that this choice function satisfies alpha, okay? Um, so if we, so that means if something is chosen in some feasible sets, it's also chosen in any subset. Okay, for two element sets, that's trivial, right? Because uh, well, we can only narrow it down to singleton sets. Then, so the only important case here is that in the three element set A B C, A is chosen, and that means A also needs to be chosen in the two element set A B and the two element set A C. Okay, and that's the case. So from A B, we are choosing A among others. And from AC, we are also choosing A. So that shows that contraction consistency or alpha is satisfied um, by this choice function. Okay? Since A is chosen in this large set here, it also needs to be chosen in any subset in which A is contained. Nevertheless, I'm claiming that um, this function is not rationalizable. Well, the only candidate would be the base relation, which is the one that I drew here, quite ugly. Um, but hopefully, despite the, the ugly figure here, you can tell what would be the maximal elements of this base relation from the set ABC. So which alternatives are maximal according to this uh, relation that I drew here? A and B, right? So A and B are both maximal, so they're indifferent between those. So, so basically, so what this relation here just says, so it's, it's even a transitive relation, so we like A and B equally well, um, and then C is less preferred. Okay, so therefore A and B are maximal elements, but this function from ABC doesn't choose A and B, it only chooses A. So this example shows that contraction consistency is not sufficient for rationalizability. So we, we do need more, because the function satisfies alpha, but it's not rationalizable. And in the end, we want to have this, this equivalence of rationalizability and consistency. So therefore, we need more than alpha. Well, and maybe not very surprisingly, um, this will be this other condition, which is dual to contraction consistency and which is called expansion consistency. Okay, and this expansion consistency condition is called gamma. Um, so there's also a condition called beta, and so I'm not introducing all the conditions in the literature here. Um, so if you like expansion consistency better than gamma, you can just say expansion. And gamma says the following, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's just as intuitive, maybe even more intuitive than what we had with alpha. So gamma just said, if some alternative is chosen from one feasible set, and the same alternative is also chosen from another feasible set, then this very same alternative should also be chosen from the union of these two sets. Okay, so it's called expansion because, so first, contraction was called contraction because we say that if x is chosen in a large set, it's also chosen in a small set. And expansion is just the other way around. So we are just saying if something is chosen in two small sets, then it's also chosen in the union of these. So we are making conclusions about which alternative should be chosen in a large choice set from choices in smaller sets. Okay, so it's like if, um, yeah, so if, if some alternative is among the best alternatives in feasible set A, and it's also among the best in feasible set B, then it should also be among the best in the union of these. That's what expansion consistency is about. Now we can again look at this plurality example here. Um, so I believe it's the very same example that I used before. So in this single example, both alpha and gamma are violated by plurality. Just to see how this condition is satisfied. So from feasible set AB, here we are choosing B, so let's just restri restrict this preference profile to only A and B. So that means B would win because B has a score of 4. 
Okay, from BC also B wins, so let's just ignore A here. So that means we have five people who like B the best if A is not there anymore. So then B is also chosen, but in the union of these, so if you just take the entire preference profile here, alternative A is the best. Okay, so this is an example which shows that plurality, if taken as a, as a choice function, violates both alpha and gamma. So one thing you may already be, or may have wondered about is, is whether these conditions are actually independent from each other, and that is the case. So by independent, I mean it's not the case that alpha implies gamma or that gamma implies alpha. And if you want to show the independence of axioms, which we are doing frequently also later on in this course, you have to come up with examples of choice functions which satisfy alpha but not gamma in this particular case, um, uh, or choice functions that satisfy gamma but not alpha. Okay, so once you have such an example, you know that they are logically independent from each other. Uh, and this will be another uh, homework exercise on the upcoming exercise sheet. So, so it sounds fancy like you're proving the independence of two axioms, but you only need to come up with two different choice functions. Okay. All right, so now we get to the main theorem of, of today's lecture, which is to establish, oh, I forgot one thing. Um, That was bad timing, but uh, yeah, I, I still want to show you this figure for, for gamma, right? Um, I don't know how helpful they are, but um, so just to, to visualize uh, the gamma condition again. So we have two different feasible sets, A and B. So the orange part is chosen from A, the green part is chosen from B. Um, and now we say that if these two choice sets overlap, so the orange and the green part, so if, the, if it's just like this here, then um, this intersection is a subset of what is chosen from A and B. Okay, so that means so here we need to do it a bit differently. So let's, by in the blue color, denote what is chosen from A union B. And this has to contain this intersection here. So everything that is in this weirdly colored part, which is a mixture of orange and green, has to be contained in the blue set. So this is exactly what what gamma is about, okay? So as I said, so it's just a visualization, but maybe gamma was simple enough for you to, to understand it even without this visualization. Okay, um, but now this uh, main theorem for today's lecture, um, a relationship between rationalizability and consistency. So I think the theorem is now, if, if you have really followed it closely, uh, the lecture for today is, is already straightforward. What it, the only thing that it can be, so we, we know that uh, alpha is, is necessary for rationalizability, but it's, it's not sufficient. We have this other condition, gamma, but they are independent from each other. So what Amatia Sen has shown is that a choice function is rationalizable if and only if it satisfies alpha and gamma. Okay, so alpha and gamma are equivalent to a choice function being rationalizable. So Zen got a Nobel Prize in economics, not, not for this particular theorem, but for his work in welfare economics and fairness and justice. Um, many years ago, he was actually an invited speaker at TUM. Um, and uh, regarding this theorem, why this thing is useful is because um, if we now want to point out that a choice function is not rationalizable, and this is what we are interested in, so under which circumstances does a choice function fail to be rationalizable, we only need to point out a failure of alpha or gamma, or maybe even both, like in the case of plurality. Um, and these things are usually easier than arguing that no possible relation rationalizes this choice function because we only need to say if alpha is violated, for instance, we only need to say if x is chosen here, then it should also be chosen in this subset, but that's not the case. Okay, not rationalizable. Or a violation of gamma, where we say x is chosen here and it's chosen there, but it's not chosen in the union of these two feasible sets, that's a violation of gamma. So, and, and that's much uh, easier to work with than, than arguing that there is no rationalizing relation. Okay. So, this is an if and only if statement. So again, to save some time, I prepared some parts here. Um, so we want to show that S being rationalizable is equivalent to the conjunction of these two properties. So that means the direction from left to right means we have to show that alpha holds and we have to show that gamma holds under the assumption that S is rationalizable. And for the converse direction, we take alpha and gamma as given and we want to show that S is rationalizable 
Okay, and we know from lemma two that if it's rationalizable, it can only be rationalizable by the base relation. So this is already in integrated here. If, it's, if something is rationalizable by its base relation, the maximal elements coincide for all feasible sets. So this is what we need to show for the direction from right to left. And this is what we need to show for the direction, direction from left to right. And we are proving all of these things one after another. So let's start with alpha. So the only thing that we know is that this choice function is rationalizable. Um, and if it's rationalizable, it's rationalizable by its base relation. So we will use lemma two all the time. Um, and first thing that we want to show now is, is that then it also has to satisfy alpha. Okay, so let's just start with lemma two. So we know that if something is rationalizable, um, then it's rationalizable by its base relation. And um, now, in order to show alpha, we have these two feasible sets. B is contained in alpha, and X is contained in this set here. And the consequence is to show that X is also contained in this choice set of B. OK, so if X is, um, ah, OK, yeah. So if, if X is chosen from A, it has to be among the maximal elements according to the base relation. in this set A. OK. Um, now, next thing we do, so this proof is really fairly straightforward. So we, we now have this, so we started with a feasible set A. So we only took as, as an assumption that x is chosen from A uh, according to this function S. Now we have this other feasible set B, which is a subset of A. OK, and now um, B is a subset of A. And x is also an element of b. So we know that if x is chosen from this, it's a maximal element in the set, that it is it, uh, weakly preferred to all the other alternatives in A. OK, so that's just the definition of maximality. So if something is maximal, it's weakly preferred to all the other alternatives. Now, if we get rid of some of the other alternatives, it's still weakly preferred to all the other remaining alternatives. Right? So if, if b is a subset of A, and x is at least as good as any other alternative y, um, well, then um, x still has to be um, among the maximal elements in this reduced set. So this is just because uh, how maximality is, set is, uh, is, def is defined. Okay, so x has to be a maximal element, again, according to the same relation, but a smaller feasible set, in particular a subset. Um, okay, and now, we know that this function is rationalizable. Okay, so we are still taking this as an assumption. So we know that it's rationalizable. And that means if x is among the maximal elements, it's also chosen. Because maximal elements and chosen elements coincide for rationalizable function, functions. Okay, and that already completes, completes the statement of why alpha has to hold. So maybe, so we wanted to show that x is in S of b. And this is what we have just shown. So the, the only important step is the one going from here to there. The other things are just basically definitions. So if something is a maximal element in some set, then it's also a maximal element in a subset. Simple enough. OK, so that completes the first part, alpha. And next, uh, we want to show gamma. OK, so for gamma, we have some alternative x, which is um, chosen from A and chosen from B. Okay, and then we want to show that it's chosen from uh, A union B. Maybe before I write, write down the argument, because this argument is similarly simple as the one that we had for alpha. Okay, so we know that this function is rationalizable, the function S. So if, if X is chosen from A, it has to be at least as good as any other alternative in A. So you can think of this, when, I, when I'm doing this gesture here, I mean that there are only outgoing edges, so weak outgoing edges to all the other alternatives. So X is at least as good as all the other alternatives in A. X is also at least as good as all the other alternatives in B. Okay, and then what we want to show is that X should be chosen from A union B, but if, if X is at least as good as anything in A and anything in B, it's also at least as good as anything in A union B. Um, that means X is a maximal element in A union B, and by rationalizability, we ex ex exactly have shown that X is chosen from, from A union B. Okay, so that's the 
exactly the argument. Um, we only need to write down it using like formal mathematics. So again, by rationalizability, we know using lemma two that it has to be rationalizable using the base relation. So X is a maximal element according to the base relation in A and X is a maximal element of the base relation in B. So it's really, so this proof is really quite detailed. So that means that for all Y, which are in A union B, X is at least as good as Y. Okay? So that's just how, how maximality is defined. Okay, so and if that is the case, well, then X also has to be a maximal element, same relation, in A union B. Okay, because if this holds for all alternatives Y in A union B, then it is a maximal element, just by definition of, of maximality. And then again, we use rationalizability, um, which proves that X is not only a maximal element, but it's also chosen by function S, because S is a rationalizable function. Okay, so these proofs, I think quite clearly show, so there, there, there are these two properties of being a maximal element. So if something is a maximal element in a feasible set, it's also a maximal element in a feasible subset. That's pretty straightforward. If something is a maximal element in two different feasible sets, it's also a maximal element in the union of these. Because if it has only outgoing edges, well then also in the union, it also only has outgoing edges. That means we only need to show the, the other direction, going from right to left. And this is perhaps a bit more interesting. So, because what we are going to do now, um, so for this equivalence here, so we want to show that two sets are equivalent. Okay, and we show this by taking an arbitrary element of SA, and that we then show that this element, let's call it X, is also an element of, of this set. And we, we not only show the implication, but we will show that there's an, a complete equivalence. So any X that is contained in this set is also contained in that set, and there's an if and only if statement there. So if X is contained here, uh, X is contained in here, if and only if it is contained in this set here. So that's what I meant. Okay, so we start with X is in S of A. Maybe let's scroll it down to see what the assumptions are that we can now make. Um, since we are proving the direction from right to left, now we can take alpha and gamma as given, and we want to show rationalizability. Okay, so we want to show that this function S is rationalizable by its base relation, of course. Okay, and the idea that we here use is, or maybe let's make this a bit smaller. that we, use, we can only use alpha and gamma. Let's first take alpha. Okay, so if X is chosen from S of A, then by alpha it's also chosen in any subset. And we will now repeatedly use alpha. So this I usually denote by something like this. To show that this element X has to be chosen in any two element set in which X is contained. So if X is chosen from the feasible set A, it's also chosen in x plus one other element, and x plus another element, and x plus another element. So there are lots of two element subsets in which x has to be chosen by alpha. Okay, so in particular for every y, x is chosen in this two element set x, y. Okay. Um, and now the rest is really just using definitions again. Because here we even have an if and only if statement. So if X is chosen from, uh, from the two element set X, Y for any Y, so this here is just how the base relation is defined. So choices from pairs is how the base relation is defined. So if X is chosen in, in the two element set X, Y, X is weakly preferred to Y according to the base relation. And this holds for any alternative Y. Okay, so for all Y, X is weakly preferred to Y according to the base relation. 
Okay, and now if x is at least as good as any other alternative y in the feasible set A, then x is a maximal element. Right, so that's just how maximality is defined. Again, this is an if and only if statement here. Or this if and only if implication. X is a maximal element according to the base relation and A. Okay, so we have started with the assumption that x is chosen by s. Then we used alpha a couple of times. So a couple of times, I mean, for any other alternative that is, that is also contained in A. Um, we know that it's, that it's chosen from all these two element sets. That means, by definition of the base relation, that x is weakly preferred to all these other alternatives. And then x is a maximal element of the base relation. So and if x is contained in this set, we have now concluded that it's also contained in that set here. OK, so the only missing part, and I think this is where the proof is a bit nice, um, is in order to complete the proof, we want to show that these two sets are equivalent. We also need to have an implication going from here to there. Right? So we have now shown that if something is contained in here, it's contained in here. So we have shown that um, this here um, is a subset of this set, and now we want to show that the first set is a subset of the second set. And this would work if we have a series of implications going from, all the, from the right hand side to the left here. And uh, here I emphasized already that we have um, equivalences here, so it works for these steps here, but it doesn't work for this step here. So this is an implication from left to right. But we haven't used gamma yet, right? So we only used alpha. <laughs> But we also have this other condition called gamma, which says that if an alternative is chosen in two different feasible sets, it's also chosen from the union of these. Okay, so let's just take one step at a time. Let's just take um, like two of these y's here, y1 and y2. So x is chosen from the two element set x, y1, and it's chosen from the two element set x, y2. So that means x also needs to be chosen from x, y1, y2, the three element set. And now, just like we repeatedly use alpha here, we can repeatedly use gamma to use it for all these other alternatives to conclude that x has to be chosen in the entire feasible set. Because if x is chosen in every two element set, um, then it also has to be chosen in the set of all alternatives by repeatedly applying gamma. Okay, so we have all these pairwise comparisons. And, and using gamma, um, we can just deduce that so basically what we are doing here is we are like building the entire set of alternatives, or we are, we are covering the entire set of alternatives with two element sets, x plus one other alternative. And for this collection of sets, we are applying gamma. So, okay, so this is not how it's supposed to be. So we are repeatedly applying gamma, but that is for the direction from right to left. Okay, so let's try to get a complete picture of this proof here. So no more proofs for today. So I still have something to say, so we are not done yet. But uh, in case you are exhausted by the proof, so that's the last proof for today. Um, we have shown rationalizability implies both alpha and gamma. And if we have both alpha and gamma, and here you can nicely see why we need actually both of them, um, then uh, we have a rationalizability. So that means, for instance, if you have only one of alpha and gamma, so if you have only alpha, for instance, we only know that we have the inclusion from this set, uh, that you know, if we have, yeah, so if we have the inclusion of this set and that set, okay? And if we have gamma, that gives us the inclusion of this, this set and the other set. And if we have inclusion going in both directions, then these sets have to be identical. So here you can really see how, how alpha and gamma nicely work together for, um, in, in a, almost dual way. Okay. Perhaps too exhausted to have any questions, but it's if, if at any time, so of course, so you know, we have these forums on Moodle, so if, if you like rework the lectures and you, a problem comes up or something, you, you can just uh, post something in the forum and then maybe other students or, or, or uh, we will uh, help you and try to rule out any misunderstandings. Okay. But now let's get back to the consequences here. Um, okay, so as I already mentioned, so the nice thing here is that we have this, 
um, nice relationship between rationalizability and these two consistency conditions. And um, one other thing that is, I think, quite nice and elegant is that you can write down alpha and gamma and rationalizability in slightly different ways, which, which really nicely shows how alpha and gamma are dual to each other. So let's say we have two different feasible sets, A and B, and we have some alternative X, which is contained uh, at the intersection of A and B. Then contraction consistency says, if X is chosen from the union of A and B, then it's also chosen from A and from B. So, so this is equivalent to contraction consistency. So I'm claiming that, that this version of alpha is the same as real alpha. Basically, we are using alpha twice. Right? So it would be sufficient to only say that X is contained in S of A, or maybe only S of B. One of them suffices. Um, but the reason why I'm writing it down this way is because I want to show you how this is dual to gamma, because maybe you already see it. Um, expansion consistency just says, um, now the implication here is going from right to left. So maybe let's read it from right to left. So if X is chosen from A and it's chosen from B, then it's also chosen from the union of, of A and B. Okay, so I think this really nicely illustrates why alpha and gamma are dual to each other because we have the same statements, only one implication is from left to right and the other one is from right to left. And with this theorem here, with rationalizability being equivalent to alpha and gamma, we know that rationalizability, well, is exactly the same thing where we only have the implication going both ways. Right? Because that follows from the theorem that we have just shown. So because alpha and gamma are equivalent to rationalizability. So that, that's a nice way of, of seeing rationalizability. So it basically means that if X is, so X is chosen from the union of A and B, if and only if it is chosen from A and B. Okay, so these are just straightforward consequences of the theorem and just rewriting things. Okay. Um, now, there's, uh, there are no more proofs, but there, there's one other condition that I would like to introduce. Um, and this is a stronger version of expansion consistency. And um, so the main reason why I'm introducing this is because acyclicity, so rationalizability just means that something can be rationalized by an acyclic relation, okay? So a relation that doesn't contain cycles. So if you think about this hierarchy of transitivity notions, it was the weakest one that we had. And, and I also warned you against reading transitivity into this preference relation, but under many applications, it's actually useful to impose a stronger, conditions to, a stronger condition to say that the preference relation that rationalizes a function not only has to be free of cycles, but it has to be transitive, which is stronger. Okay, and for this, we need the stronger expansion consistency condition. So let's just quickly draw um, the preference relation, so the rational or the base relation for, for this particular choice function here. Okay, so we have strict preference here, strict preference there. Um, Otherwise, we have indifference, and that's it. So maybe let's just draw. So we only have to make sure which one we are drawing. So this is now the strict part of the rationalizing of the base relation of this choice function here. And I'm now claiming that this function satisfies alpha. Okay, as I said, for these three, if you have a universe consisting of only three alternatives, alpha is very easily checked because because we only need to check whether whatever we choose from the three elements set here is also chosen from the two element subsets that also contain, in, the, in this case, A here. Okay, so A is best among ABC, then A also has to be chosen from AC and from AB, and that's the case, so alpha is satisfied. In order to check whether gamma is satisfied, we need to look for alternatives that are chosen in two different feasible sets. Um, well, okay, so B doesn't really overlap with anything here, so nothing to check here. But A is chosen from AB and A is chosen from AC. Okay, so in order for gamma to be satisfied, um, A also needs to be chosen from the union of AC and AB. And that would be the set of all alternatives ABC. And that's the case here, right? So A is chosen from AB, from AC, and also from the union ABC. So alpha and gamma are satisfied. So this choice function is rationalizable, so everything's fine. Um, but this is an example um, of a rationalizing relation which maybe doesn't completely capture our intuitive understanding of rationality. Because this person strictly prefers A to B, strictly prefers B to C, but is indifferent between A and C. Right? If I would draw the weak uh, preference relation, there would be indifference between A and C. 
Um, so it's still okay with uh, rationalizability, but uh, maybe it's, it's uh, also a natural strengthening of rational, rationalizability to demand that the rationalizing relation not only has to be uh, acyclic, but even transitive. Okay, so this one here already uh, violates quasi-transitivity, as you can see. Okay, and that's why we're defining the stronger condition, which is called beta plus. Okay, so beta plus again, has two different feasible sets, A and B. B is a subset of A, and it says whatever is chosen, if, the, if something that is, if, or if the best elements of A intersect with B, then whatever is the best alternative in B also has to be among the best alternatives in A. So it's an expansion consistency condition because we are relating choices from a small set with choices from a large set. Okay, so B is a subset of A, so if something is chosen in the small set, it's also chosen in the large set. Okay, so maybe if you think, if you go all the way back to alpha. So alpha said, if x is chosen, then it should also be chosen in any subset in which it is contained. So if you now want to define the strongest expansion consistency condition that you can think of, you could say, if x is chosen in some feasible set, then it should also be chosen in all supersets in which it is contained. Right, so and that would be the condition where we don't have this thing here. <laughs> then we would just say, if an alternative is chosen, then it's also chosen in all supersets. But th this condition is completely um, almost set a swear word. So it's, it's a very bad condition <laughs> um, or a trivial condition uh, because if you say that an alternative that is chosen in, in some feasible set has, has to be chosen in all supersets, um, well, then you can start with a singleton set in which each alternative is chosen as the only element. And that means that from any set, you have to choose all the alternatives. Right, so if, if, if you look at singleton A, A has to be chosen. If it has also be chosen in all supersets, then, okay, do you take the large feasible set? Then A has to be chosen. By the same argument, B has to be chosen, C has to be chosen, and so on. So if you leave out this condition here, you get an expansion consistency condition which says in every feasible set, you have to choose everything. Okay, so th that doesn't really make much sense. And therefore, we have this extra condition here. So we only say that something has to be chosen in a larger feasible set if the best alternatives from the larger feasible set at least overlap with the set B. Okay, and for this I also have um, this visualization. Maybe here it helps best because like, I think most people, so it's a bit unfortunate that this is at the end of the lecture because beta plus I think is a bit harder to understand than, than maybe alpha and gamma. So alpha and gamma, once you have internalized these, these are really very straightforward, whereas beta plus takes a bit of time getting used to. Um, so just similar to alpha, we have two feasible sets, B and A, that are contained in each other. And then we have this extra condition. And if this is the case, then S of B has to be a subset of S of A. S of B is the green set here. and has to be a subset of this orange set here. OK, so let's just take this entire thing here. Um, so first, if I would somehow squeeze this in like, like this, um, then B would not even intersect F S of A. Okay. But as soon as they, as they overlap, then everything that is chosen from B has to be chosen from A. So the green set has to be a subset of the orange set. So what I've shown here is a violation of beta plus. Okay, so as soon as B overlaps with the orange set here, everything in the green set has to go in the, red, in, in the orange set. Okay, so something like this doesn't work. But once we do it like this, that's fine. Okay, so that's, that's what beta plus means. Sometimes, so I, I didn't mention when I was talking about alpha. So with alpha, there's usually, so you, you can say, um, I, I also once read this in a book. So if somebody is um, among the best tennis players in Europe, um, then this person also has to be among the best tennis players in Germany. Okay, so if, that, that's alpha. So if something is among the best alternatives in the larger feasible set, then it also has to be among the best alternatives in the smaller feasible set. And therefore, beta plus can be seen similarly. So if um, there's a top European tennis player who happens to be from Germany, then the best tennis players from Germany are also among the best tennis players in Europe. Okay, so maybe here you can see why this is, is slightly trickier maybe than alpha, but there's a, um, a similar story to this kind of, of uh, condition. Okay, 
one thing, so and another homework exercise. So it's beta plus, well, it, it wouldn't be called strong expansion consistency if it's not stronger than our regular expansion consistency condition. So beta plus implies gamma. Um, and so since nobody was asking, so usually somebody asks, so why is it called beta plus and not just beta? So there's also a condition called beta, which is slightly different from beta plus, um, which I think in the yeah, right. If, if, alpha, if alpha also holds, then beta and beta plus are equivalent to each other, but in general they are not. So there's a reason why, why this is called beta plus. Um, but uh, the important part here is that beta plus is actually stronger than, than gamma, and usually beta plus is called the strongest reasonable expansion consistency condition, because the other one that I sketched earlier, which was even stronger, was just completely stupid, because you always have to select everything. So you say, if x is chosen in some feasible set, then always select everything. So okay, it's expansion. You have a choice in the larger set, uh, in the smaller set, and deduce a choice in the larger set, but it's, it's much too strong. So the, the strongest sensible expansion consistency condition is what beta plus is, and the strongest contraction consistency condition, which says that if something is chosen in a larger set, it should also be chosen in a smaller one, is, is alpha. Okay, and the reason why I'm showing this to you is this here. Um, so there's a theor theorem by Arrow. So it's the same Kenneth Arrow who proved the famous impossibility theorem, but that's not the impossibility theorem. So don't be confused here. So it's a different statement that he proved, which is very similar to what we had for, for Zen's characterization. And he has shown that a choice function is rationalizable by a transitive relation if and only if it satisfies alpha and beta plus. Okay, so it's, it's uh, like an anal analogous statement to what we had uh, by Zen. So Zen showed that rationalizability is equivalent to alpha and gamma. And what Arrow has shown that transitive rationalizability, which is stronger, right, so you have to be rationalized by a transitive relation, is equivalent to alpha and beta plus. Okay, so the alpha part remains the same, but beta plus is stronger than gamma. <coughs> so that means like some, if you want to prove this statement, which we are not going to do here, so some parts you get for free because of Zen's theorem. So if something is transitively rationalizable, it's also ra rationalizable by a not necessarily transitive relation, um, and then alpha has to hold. We know this from Zen's theorem, which we showed earlier. Okay, so this part we get for free, but the rest we would need to show separately. Um, okay, and then also in economics, so the, the conjunction of alpha and beta plus is known as the weak axiom of revealed preference, which has, has this very cool acronym WARP. Um, there's also a strong axiom of revealed preference, which we are not going to introduce here. Um, but this has a special name, so the conjunction of alpha and beta plus, because rationalizability by a transitive relation is, is very important, because as I said uh, earlier, so usually when you think about preference relations, you assume transitivity, right? So um, we have seen that acyclicity is sufficient for always choosing something from a feasible set, but in some cases you want to have a stronger notion of, of uh, rationality for a preference relation, and once you have transitivity, this is exactly equivalent to alpha and beta plus. And the reason why transitivity is so important because Many, many relations that we deal with are transitive. So for instance, if you have utility functions where we assign numbers to different alternatives, well then um, the, the preference relation that we get from this, if we prefer something that has higher utility, is of course a transitive relation because the greater or equal relation on the natural or real numbers is, is a transitive relation. So in, in, the, in many parts of economics we, have, we actually use numbers as, as utility functions and then the underlying preference relations are by default transitive. But what we have learned today is that transitivity is like an add-on that is not really necessary. If we just want to make choices from any feasible set, acyclicity is already uh, sufficient. Okay, so this uh, thing is, I, I think it's the last thing that I'm going to show you. So I'm actually finishing a slightly bit earlier um, than I have to. So uh, bear with me for a couple of minutes. Um, so what I want to show you now is something that is, uh, I think, a, a quite nice illustration of how you can trick people in belief that certain axioms are dual to each other, where even, even though that's not necessarily the case. So I, I hopefully convinced you earlier that alpha and gamma are dual to each other because we had this slide where gamma was the implication from left to right and alpha was the, or the other way around. So alpha was the implication from left to right and gamma was the implication from right to left. Right? So it was the very same term, it's only that the arrows changed. Um, I'm now, I'm now going to do the very same thing for alpha and beta plus, which are different conditions. They also seem to be dual to each other. Um, because, uh, 
Yeah, right. Okay, so maybe let's just reveal all of these. Um, so, just quickly here, once we see all of these, so first, before I explain how this works, so it's, it's pretty obvious um, what I mean by dual here, because all of these three lines are identical. Here we have equality, here we have superset, and here we have subset. Okay, so and that's why you could argue that alpha and beta plus are dual to each other. This is the inclusion from left to right. It's here it's from right to left. Um, and now I'll see why, why these conditions are actually the ones that I'm claiming they are. Beta plus is exactly how I defined it. So it's just how I defined the condition. Um, for alpha here, we, this, is, this looks really like the alpha condition that you are used to, the one that we used for our definition, except that we have this extra statement here, so that this set has to be non-empty. Okay? I just added it to make it look similar to beta plus, but this condition is completely unnecessary. Why? Well, if this is the empty set, okay, so if, if S A intersects B is empty, well, then this is the empty set here, and the empty set is contained in every set. Okay, it, it doesn't change anything. So we can add it for fun, but it's, it's not necessary. So that shows that this is the same alpha condition um, as the one that you're used to. And then equality just follows from Arrow's theorem here. So warp is equivalent to both of these conditions. So if you have inclusion in one direction and in the other direction, that means equality. Okay, so it's just uh, like uh, what I did below sense theorem on, this, on that slide. Uh, I'm showing you that how these different definitions can be seen as dual to each other, only that we are now using different conditions. So in, in some sense, alpha and gamma are dual to each other, but in another sense, alpha and beta plus are dual to each other. So that's the, the main lesson, I guess, here is just to be careful with these syntactic equivalences. So they look similar, but dual, I don't mean in a formal sense here. Okay, so I think that's what I explained already. So the, the reason why warp is so important is because once you have transitivity, um, it means that you have like a weak ranking of the alternatives, which for instance could come from, from utility numbers assigned to the different alternatives. I guess, yeah, that was my last slide. So that, because that's why we are continuing, not next week, but in two weeks, because next week there's Allerheiligen on Tuesday. So you will have two weeks for the upcoming exercise sheet, and then we will move on to social choice and talk about collective decision making. Okay, thanks for your attention.